Hey folks, Elijah here, uh, co-creator of Burr. I'm going to be walking you through what we talked about in the blog post, uh, sort of giving you an overview of Burr, what we can do, and sort of where we want to go. Cool. Um, so if you haven't uh, read it, for reference, you'll be able to check all of this out of information on the blog. Uh, you can go to blog.diverse.io and click on Burr Developing Stateful AI Applications. We're going to be going over this uh, in a more sort of interactive way. All right. So the problem that Burr is trying to solve is twofold. We want to, uh, one, make it easier to manage state in AI applications, and two, make it easier to understand the decisions that these applications made. To us, those are two sides of the same coin. Uh, an application will hold state, and it'll make decisions based off of that state. So you can represent it sort of as a state machine, which means you're sort of like modifying the state as you go along. And if you do that explicitly, you get all sorts of benefits. So. What does this look like? Well, let's create a very simple chat bot. Now, this is something that like GP2 does for you, um, but this will sort of illustrate how Burr works. So I'm gonna do this all in a Jupyter notebook. You can follow it along in the examples uh, slash blog on the uh, GitHub page. But let's start first by installing uh, Burr. All right. So we're gonna install Burr. If you still install Burr start, you can run the terminal command which is just Burr, it'll start up the uh, telemetry UI that we'll show you later. Um, then let's import some stuff. Right. Let's importing some things that we'll use later. And now let's get started. So we're gonna build a very simple chat bot and then we're gonna add to it. There's gonna be two steps to this. One is a human input. This is an input of prompt and it sticks that prompt into state, right? Two is the AI response. This will take the prompt, query open AI, process the result and stick that into state as well. So here's what it looks like. We have two APIs in Burr, a functional and a class-based API, and we're going to be looking at the functional API. There are two functions here, one for each step, called human input and called AI response, right? So to look through this, uh, these just create this chat item in the shape that OpenAI likes, right? And sticks it into the state. So one thing to note is the shape of this, right? Actions declare what they read and declare what they write. This one reads nothing from state. The only input it gets is a parameter here, which gives it an input, but it does write two fields to state. One is the prompt and one is the chat history. You could probably squish these together if you wanted. I just kind of like having it separate uh, because it makes the state really easy to understand. So, uh, we, so yeah, the last part, we have an input called prompt. This is something that has to be fed in by the user when you actually call out to that app. We'll get to what that looks like later. So we create a chat item and it returns two things. One is it returns sort of an internal result uh, this is sort of the piece that actually runs the computation. And all this does is tell you what the prompt is. Then it does modifications on the state. So this is a state object. This is sort of core to Burr that you take and you make modifications to. The modifications are immutable though. So you actually have to use the return value. Otherwise you won't actually see the updates. So you have, uh, so yeah. So the result here is just the prompt. That's the only thing that's actually like computed in this. And the state update is updating the field prompt in state to be set to that prompt and doing an append operation on chat history to be set to chat item, which we created above. Okay. This is a chat history that we're going to feed into OpenAI. Then uh, let's define the AI response, right? So this will read chat history because we need to know the context for the conversation to pass to OpenAI. And it'll write out two things to the, uh, to the state, right? It'll write the response and the chat history as well. Again, prompt and response are just here to make it easier. We really could just be dealing with chat history, uh, but you'll see why we have this in a second. So we go through, we create our OpenAI client. You probably want to have this cache. This is just a demo. Uh, we do our chat completion. We then create our chat item and we append it to the chat history. Simple stuff. Um, now we are maintaining this chat history and state. We're maintaining the recent prompt and the recent response. It should be good to go. These are the two actions. Now let's create our application. The application ties together actions and transitions between them. So if you've seen LangGraph, there's a very similar notion. Uh, if you've seen a state machine, this is actually an inverse of how state machines are usually represented. State machines usually have state as nodes and transition as edges. These have actions as edges, as uh, nodes that go to different actions that sort of merge them both in one. Um, but as you can see, we're using this application builder we're passing in actions, the keyword arguments name it. So the human input is named human input. The AI response is named AI response. Uh, there's the name, there's the value. And it's got transitions between them. So transitions can be conditional. We'll show you what that looks like in a bit. But for now, these transitions just have a from and a to, right? So a transition from human input to AI response 
from AI response to human input. Uh, we started off with nothing in the chat history because it's empty. And we started off with the entry point as human input, right? Because that's the thing we need to start. With. Remember the human input takes in the in, uh, input prompt. So we're good to go there. So it looks like you pass in an input prompt, then human input is run and it goes to AI response, then it goes back because we're gonna wanna loop back. However, we're gonna wanna stop at AI response every time so we can show it to the user and allow you to pass in a prompt, right? So what does it actually look like? Well, we have a lot of methods on the app that sort of run in a custom way, uh, but for now all you'll interact with is run. Run halts after a certain point. So it can all there halt after or halt before. In this case, we're gonna say, once you've computed AI response, give me back all the data you've got, right? So we pass in the input, which is prompt, which again, recall uh, corresponds to this parameter here and is an input that is declared by human input. Um, then we build it, right? And then we can visualize it. So this is just some tooling built in. You'll also see we have visualization in the telemetry app uh, and visualizing it will give us a input, a human action to an AI response and back. Then to run it, we uh, call this run function, as I was saying, we take out the final action that was run, the result and the state. Um, you probably don't need final action if you have one thing in halt after, but if you have two things, it's pretty useful because then you know which one it actually halted after. The result is just that intermediate result that we got from earlier. And the state is the state of it at the end of running this. And the prompt is who is Aaron Burr. So we print out our response and we are good to go. Now we have a streaming uh, setup for Burr as well. There's a way to make the last one streaming. We're not gonna go over that now, that's more advanced. All right, so this is a really simple state machine um, and totally pointless if you're just gonna use chat GPT. This just sort of mimics what it does and calls out to it. Uh, but let's add a decision-making step. So a decision-making step is gonna involve a conditional transition, right? And we're gonna add a step to check if the prompt is safe. Again, OpenAI will do this for you. Um, you have no choice but to let us do it for you. But in this case, we're gonna mimic it. Uh, say you're calling out to some specific model that tells you whether a prompt is safe or not, or you set up a prompt and uh, poke that model to see if it's safe. You'll get, um, we're just gonna mimic that by seeing if the word unsafe is in prompt, it'll be unsafe, otherwise it'll be safe, right? So this one reads in that prompt, which you wrote earlier, and writes to this variable safe in state. Uh, and we, so we define it as safety check, right? And all we're saying is if unsafe is not in the state, then we return uh, that it's safe, otherwise we return it's not safe. Then we're gonna give it a response to do when it's unsafe. So this is a terminal action and all it's gonna to respond to is by saying, I'm sorry, my overlords have forbidden me to respond. You can see that it updates the response as we did earlier and appends the chat history um, with this content, right? It's just making sure the state is in the right place. So this can be a good terminal action and you can use the state after you've run through everything. So now we're gonna build it uh, and the, we're doing the same thing as above. We're just creating these actions they each have names. Uh, the names correspond to the function name. For now, there are cases where you can sort of like parameterize the functions and curry them and do different things. Um, but for now, we're just gonna use these same function names. We're gonna add transitions. So in this case, instead of going from human to AI and back, we're gonna go from the human input to the safety check, right? Because first thing we wanna do is to, uh, check if it's safe. If the response is not safe, then we're gonna go to unsafe response, which is a terminal step or a step that we will be, be wanting to stop at. So that's when uh, safe is false. Otherwise we'll go from safety check back to the uh, to the AI response saying it is safe. We can actually ask the AI to do it when safe is true. Otherwise we'll go from both unsafe response to AI response back to human input, right? Which is gonna have to wait again to get the prompt in. Then we visualize it and it looks something like this. You can see these uh, edges are labeled with a condition. So safety check to AI response happens when safe is true. Safety check to unsafe response happens when safe is false. Cool. So now let's run it. Uh, and the difference here is we're gonna halt after either one of these are hit. So if you pass two things, it'll halt after uh, either AI response or unsafe response are hit. This is how we know that we have hit like a terminal response, which will go back to human input. You could also do a halt before human input, which would say before you get there, uh, we might want an input and then you could pass an input to the next run. It's kind of up to you. Um, but in this case, we're gonna ask it who was Aaron Burser unsafe and open the response, which says, I'm sorry, my overlords have forbidden me to respond exactly as you expect. So. You can imagine things getting a lot more complicated than this, right? Uh, the example that this is sort of based on in the repo has something where it selects a model to use based off of the prompt. So it has one uh, step that'll check. So it'll first check for safety, then it'll check which mode it should respond to. It has a bunch of modes and it can go to these sort of different modes. 
Um, let me pull up what that looks like. Um, so you can see it's something like this, right? Uh, you go from decide mode, you could go to generate an image, generate code, answer a question, prompt for more, which means it doesn't know. Go back to response and it'll all go back to prompt, right? Um, you can kind of make it as complicated as you want. And the thing that we're really excited about is that you can make it more complex as it goes along. So you can add new steps, you can add new state transitions, and you're not dealing with sort of like the crazy mess of if else statements, recursive functions, et cetera, to ensure that you're in the right, uh, the right position. So let's now work with the uh, tracking application. So Burr comes out of the bat with telemetry involved. You can get this by running the Burr command. Uh, if you go here, you can look at all the projects we've got. You can also look at the demos. Um, there's a chatbot demo in which you can actually converse with it as it's going along. That's an implementation of the chatbot, and you can sort of see it think as it's responding. Uh, we're just going to go with one that I called getting started. It's like here. Um, let's actually get it set up and running, and then we can go back and watch it uh, move along. Cool. So. In this case, we're going to add a tracker to the app. This is exactly the same as it was before, but we've added this with tracker. This is a local tracker, and uh, it knows it has to know about a project, so we pass in a project. It's uh, called demo getting started. Um, then let's build it. So same thing, we just added one line, and now you get full telemetry and tracking. This is working on localhost, although we're going to be building stuff that works in the cloud. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a few different things here, right? Uh, we're going to run through and watch it go along. So I have a bunch of questions. I'm going to add a few more because this will give me time to navigate over to the server and see what happens. So I'm going to uh, just run it and let's watch our application think. So one thing to know is that each application has an app ID. This one has been automatically created. Um, if we actually ask for the app with tracker dot user or dot uh, unique ID, we'll get something like this. This ID will help us find the one in the UI that we want to look at. So now we're going through and prompting it. Uh, there it is. So the steps you can see it's going through running live. It's stuck here on the A I response, taking a little bit of time. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in this telemetry UI. Now let's see if it what it's doing. Um, you know, it just it just ran through. So I think it, yeah. So it just took some address. There's a live mode here that you can press that it'll run. Uh, but this will allow you to sort of understand what happened at any given point, right? So you can see all the code here for the actions. You can go through, you can see the data as it went along. So you can see the state at any given point. So it's like, okay, the chat history start, starts empty and we keep adding it more. Let's say we want to understand the uh, safety check. So we're like, oh, um, we have the human input here is, uh, uh, yeah, the human input here is a prompt. Safety check is, uh, safety check says it's safe. The AI response then says uh, what my MLAI library is named Hamilton and Bird do. Um, it's making Hamilton is data analysis through relation economic modeling. Uh, Burke via library focused on adversarial machine learning. It's being kind of cute. Um, in our case, Hamilton is a library for building DAGs. Burr is a library for state machines. They kind of work nicely together because state machines can call out to DAGs. Uh, and yeah, you can understand what it did every, at every point. The goal here is if your application is acting weird, it's making sort of some strange decision, you can look at it and see exactly what it did to make that decision. You can even reload from where it was take that and sort of like poke the AI in a certain way, right? So obviously you want some sort of determinism, uh, but this gives you the information afterwards if you haven't gotten that determinism and then the ability to sort of like go in, create it, reproduce it, study what it did and understand the bad cases, right? Uh, we are working on a feature to be able to tag these and sort of uh, add them to a data set. So hold tight, we'll get to that soon. So all we had to do to get access to this whole UI was add a tracker and watch it go through. All right. Um, so I, if you download the notebook, you've got the ability to actually look at the UI inside the notebook. Um, it's kind of fun. You can run through. It's like you can run through this again and then watch it change. Right. Um, you can see it's now running through it and actually moving along live. Probably better to do another window. Um, 
sort of fun way to demonstrate. So that is telemetry. Um, and that's purely for tracking and understanding exactly what happened. We also have a capability of persistence, which is related, uh, but more sort of for building a production app. Again, I promised you earlier, state management is the really hard part. Um, and we wanted to be able to stop from where it failed, to stop and sort of rewind to a certain point, to load up from some point and see what happened and do all sorts of cool stuff like that, right? So uh, we have a whole set of pre-built persisters. We've got Postgres, SQLite 3, Redis, and we also have a custom persister class that you can extend. And to add it is pretty easy. So in this case, we're actually going to create the identifiers. This will allow me to sort of demonstrate it. Um, but the app ID is some like unique app ID and the partition key I'm going to call uh, new bur user. Uh, the app ID is just so you can identify it uh, among the project. It's going to be unique among all those in a project. And the partition key is something like user ID, right? It's just some way that you can demonstrate it. Now, these are sort of utilities that Burr thinks of as first class, but you can do whatever you want here. Um, if you have different ways of organizing, if you have different indices, you can write a custom persister class that'll save it in exactly the way you want and load it up as well. So we're going to create an app. I'm putting this in a function so that I can sort of demonstrate what this looks like uh, in terms of persistence. But I'm going to initialize a persister. This one has a database here and a table name. I'm going to initialize it. This is ensuring that it actually creates the database. Uh, you only have to call this one time. Well, I think it's idempotent, so you can call it many times. Um, you have the uh, application builder here. So we're going through, we're creating our actions, transition, same deal as before, but we're using something slightly different. So instead of having with state, we have initialized from, where it starts in with a default state, a default entry point. We want it to uh, resume at the next action that it left off. You can also have it reset back to its entry point. Um, and we want to initialize it from the same SQLite persister. So this is what we're saying we want to read from the state. Uh, now we're going to say we want to save to the state. That just adds a state persister. So we want to both read from and save to it, right? So when it loads up, it'll initialize from this persister. It'll start off where it left off. And when we, uh, after every step, we will be able to write the state and synchronize it with the database. So that if it fails somewhere, we can pause and restart where it left off. Cool. So let's uh, create that function. And I am going to create an app and run it with a few with a single prompt, who is Aaron Burser. And we're going to see it print out the uh, role and the content. Um, this is after a few different runs I've already done here. Uh, so ah, that problem I didn't run this. Okay, so once I run this, It'll create a new app ID, run this, and run that. It should be a uh, chat history of one. There we go. And this is the only thing in this quote unquote conversation. So now I'm going to get rid of that app. Then I'm going to reload it by calling that again. It'll create a thing with the same persistence, uh, with the same persistence IDs. I'll run it and you'll see this chat will also be there, right? There we go. We have the same chat as above. We also have another item in there asking who was Alexander Hamilton. Great. So sort of a whirlwind tour, um, but hopefully this should get you started and understand some of the very basics of the library. There's a lot more. Let me walk you through some of the uh, core capabilities here that we have built out. So going to the docs, burr.dagworks.io, uh, you can go to some concepts. So application, state, actions, and all of that. Transitions, there are a few different sort of ways to transition between, and also this is customizable, so you can have a very specific one. Most of the time, you'll just be using some variable. The goal is to keep the complexity away from the transitions and put them into the actions, because the actions are really easy to debug. They're just functions. Uh, and we've got a whole capability of sort of hooks, right? So all of these persistent telemetry, persistent telemetry, et cetera, are built off of this hook uh, library that's sort of publicly exposed. So if you want to print, a line, print some line before and after every action, you can do that with a print line hook. It'll get called out, um, and there's a whole bunch more you can use. Say if you want to include a Datadog hook, we haven't written it yet, but we will soon. You can have it so it gives you some basic information on the action. Uh, tracking, this is the tracking library. We have this locally. This is for debugging. We're going to be put, uh, building out a cloud mode that you can sort of deploy and have the tracker persist in a non-file system uh, sort of scalable database as well. State persistence, this is the same thing we talked about, um, but there's a class that you can use to write. If you extend the base persister class, you can use that to write your own persistence. We have the capability of streaming actions. So 
will have the last action in a chain be streaming. And that way you can call out and you can be like, oh, I want to see a sort of response stream in. This reduces the time to first token. There is a, yeah, so there's more uh, visibility here. So this is kind of cool. Um, if we look at the projects and we look at the tracing demo, so all of these demos will come with your, sorry, I uh, messed up, messed my own local one. Um, let me just uh, fix that real quick. Oh, all right. So if you look at the uh, tracing demo, you can see that there are a set of traces here. There's, each one has a sub span. The idea is each step consists of a series of steps. So if you can look in decide mode, it first generates the prompt, queries OpenAI, which creates an OpenAI client and then queries OpenAI, and then processes the, processes the response. The idea is uh, on a certain level, these could be represented as a DAG, so we also sort of store the edges between them. This is modeled after OpenTel, so if you just want to plug this into OpenTel, that's super easy. Um, but we're going to be adding the ability to, uh, to attach artifacts and attach annotations to these. Um, so this gives you sort of more visibility inside what each one of those functions are doing. We have a prototype integration with LangChain and Hamilton, where your uh, LangChain sort of chain can hook into the tracer, and that can be run as a LangChain callback. Hamilton as well, so you can sort of see each step here logged in the UI. It can help you figure out, tell what takes a while, and you can also log metadata and annotations when we get that out. Um, so visibility, and then we've got a lot we're working on. Um, so one thing we're working on is uh, state types. We have sort of improvements to make to the state API to make it super efficient. Uh, compilation and validation, we want to make it so we can check as many errors as possible. Earlier, um, exception management, there's sort of, you can sort of have error hooks that'll go, that'll allow you to transition back to a state and retry something. That could be a pretty natural thing. Uh, streaming results, that's already done, and more integrations. So yeah, go have a look. Um, to get started, I would jump on the GitHub repository, github.com slash dagworks dash inc slash burr. You can look through, there's sort of a quick start. This will get you set up with that server. Uh, the server also has a demo, so play around with that first. If you don't have an open IQ, you can still see the uh, items in the demo. You can still see sort of a history of chats and load it up and that demonstrates how persistence works. But I would also get your own open IQ and sort of play around with it. Um, with GPT 3.5 Turbo, it's super cheap. So uh, overview of how it works, what you can do with it with some applications, uh, how you can start building. Here's a comparison against common frameworks and then why the name Burr. Um, as you've noticed, we have another library called Hamilton that we love. Uh, and it's sort of more for like building data pipelines and DAGs. Uh, it can work really nicely with Burr though. Um, so we just named, we had one library named Hamilton, one library named Burr. If you don't know about their dual, it's one of the, the most famous parts of American history. It's a really fun story. So if you haven't seen the musical, uh, highly recommend looking it up. It's a good read and a lot of things on our roadmap. So yeah, that's a high level overview. Um, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to reach out if you have any questions.